My name is Ezra Steiger. I'm a professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. This presentation will be on short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure management. Disclosures are that I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee for Corum Home Healthcare, and I'm also an investigator for Zeeland Pharmaceutical, the manufacturer of glepaglutide. Short bowel syndrome has been defined as clinical features associated with remaining small bowel length of less than 200 centimeters in continuity from the ligament of trites. A proposed ICD-11 code for this will be K96. On the other hand, intestinal failure is a reduction of gut function below the minimum necessary for the absorption of macronutrients and or water and electrolytes such that intravenous supplementation is required to maintain health and or growth. The new ICD-11 proposed designation is K97. Normal intestinal length of the small bowel is between 300 and 600 centimeters, whereas the large bowel is approximately 150 centimeters. The minimal intestinal length needed to avoid intestinal failure has been estimated to be approximately 100 centimeters of small bowel if there is a segment of the colon remaining as well or 150 centimeters of small bowel if there is no remaining colon. Morphologically, the small bowel is more than just a simple cylinder. This cartoon illustrates the uh, 280 centimeter cylinder of small bowel having it absorbed a surface area of about 3,300 square centimeters. But added to that are Kirkring's folds, villi, and microvilli, and that increases the surface area 600 fold to approximately 2 million square centimeters or the surface area of a tennis court. It's not only the small bowel that plays a role in absorption, however. Carbohydrate and soluble fiber that makes its way into the colon is acted on there by bacteria to form short chain fatty acids and various gases. The short chain fatty acids are a source of calories and their absorption enhances the absorption of sodium and water as well. The anatomical classification of short bowel syndrome is type 1, which is an end jejunostomy with no colon. Type 2 is a jejunocolic anastomosis with no ileocecal valve and part of the colon in continuity. And type 3, a jejunoiliocolic anastomosis with the ileocecal valve and most of the colon in continuity. This cartoon shows the type 1 anatomical configuration, essentially an end jejunostomy, where there's large fluid losses, there's nutrient malabsorption, poor jejunal adaptation, acid hypersecretion, rapid gastric emptying, rapid intestinal transit, and if there's less than 100 centimeters of this small bowel left, that usually results in intestinal failure and the need for IV fluids and or IV nutrition. Type 2 is an aleocolatic resection where there's malabsorption of bile sauce and B12. 
There's purge, as you know, adaptation, rapid intestinal transit, small bowel bacterial overgrowth can occur, and because of the loss of the distal ileum and proximal colon, there's reduced break hormones. Less than 65 centimeters of small bowel, and this anatomic configuration will result in intestinal failure and the need for IV fluids and or intravenous nutrients. Type three, where there's a jejunal ileal resection, but there's maintenance of the distal ileum and proximal colon and the ileocecal valve. There's good ileo adaptation, preserved absorption of B12 and bile salts with a normal intestinal transit. The break hormones are present in the distal ileum and proximal colon, and it takes a great amount of small bowel resection so that there's only 30 centimeters of remnant small intestine to result in intestinal failure. In the look at the pathophysiologic mechanism of intestinal failure in a large series of adults with chronic intestinal failure due to benign disease, this is almost 3,000 patients, most of those instances are type 1 or small bowel jejunal anatomy with an end jejunostomy. The next largest group are type 2 with a jejunal colic anastomosis, and a smaller group is type 3 with a jejunal ileoanastomosis, an intact ileocecal valve, and the presence of the colon. There are three phases involved in the postoperative management of short bowel syndrome. The early phase, the adaptation phase, and the maintenance phase. The early phase starts immediately after surgery and lasts for weeks. There are potential complications from the surgical procedure itself, and there are large losses of intestinal fluid. In addition, there's gastric hypersecretion that increases the total amount of fluid loss, the occurrence of dehydration, renal failure, electrolyte and acid base imbalance is very common. In that early phase, it's still very important to pay attention to the patient's caloric and protein requirements. And this just illustrates those requirements based on the patient's BMI. And for most patients, that's between 20 and 35 calories per kilogram per day, and at least one and a half to two grams of protein per kilogram per day. In addition, one should be aware of some of the obscure sources of protein losses that can occur in patients, especially those with abdominal fluid losses in an open abdomen or patients with extensive uh, jejunostomy secretions or fistula fluid losses. That can account for three to a half grams of protein loss for each liter of jejunostomy secretions or 12 and a half grams of protein loss for each liter of abdominal fluid loss in patients with an open abdomen. In the adaptation phase of short bowel syndrome management, the small bowel and colonic mucosa undergo hyperplasia. They're slowing gastrointestinal transit, and all this is promoted by the presence of intraluminal nutrients. And it's also stimulated by gut hormones produced by the distal ileum and colon, if those are still present. This adaptation phase may last up to two years. <laughs> 
The intestinal adaptation is helped by maintaining oral nutrient intake. It's also helped by the length and anatomy of the remaining bowel, such as type 2 or type 3 anatomic configurations. If there's underlying disease that will inhibit intestinal adaptation, gut hormones and growth factors can also improve intestinal adaptation. The presence of a colon, as mentioned before, will improve intestinal adaptation. And the younger the patient's age, that will enhance intestinal adaptation as well. The chronic phase of short bowel syndrome or intestinal failure management will require special diets, supplements, and medication to reduce intestinal fluid output. There also is a need for home intravenous fluids or home parenteral nutrition. Intestinal rehab programs can be helpful to reduce or eliminate dependence on HPN or home IV fluids. If the patient has intestinal failure and requires hope parental nutrition supplementation, it's important to identify that that patient has impaired intestinal absorption as demonstrated by fat malabsorption or failure of tube feeding for the purposes of Medicare approval for home parental nutrition. The treatment should be needed for greater than 30 days or for Medicare purposes is considered permanent if it's required for at least 90 days. The patient should understand the program and want it, and the patient or household members should be able to learn all that's involved in maintaining the program safely. The patient should also have a prolonged, meaningful life possible, and in most instances, that means at least 90 days. And also, there should be insurance or other financial coverage that should be evaluated. The success of a home parental nutrition program depends on obtaining adequate, safe venous access. There are a number of venous access devices that can be used, but the tunneled cuffed catheter is the primary device that's used for most patients. The uh, cuff winds up being placed in the tunneled uh, in the tunnel from the exit site to the insertion site and the appropriate fetus access. Subcutaneous ports can be used as well as pick lines, but the incidence of complications is increased with pick lines and subcutaneous ports, if used and if they become infected, have to be removed and cannot be rendered infection-free. Whereas the tunneled cuffed catheters can be uh, rendered infection-free. The venous access sites include the internal jugular vein, and that's the most common site. And that can be accessed by the uh, surgical team or more commonly by interventional radiologists. Subclavian veins can also be accessed. In patients where there's no longer any upper extremity venous access, translumbar inferior vena cava can be accessed, or the saphenous febrile veins can be used for venous access. It's important whatever site is used that the tip of the catheter is placed at or below the junction of the right atrium or superior vena cava. And this report looking at venous access device placement sites, the 
incidence of malfunction is increased as the tip is placed uh, above the junction of the right atrium or superior vena cava. And the higher up in the superior vena cava, the more likely there is to be percentage of malfunction. So that six centimeters or above the right atrium superior vena cava site has a very high incidence of malfunction. This x-ray demonstrates an appropriate placement of a venous excess uh, Mount position site at the junction of the superior vena cava and right atrium at the red arrow. This subclavian central venous catheter site, uh, the tip position is inappropriate in that it's uh, butting against the sidewall of the uh, superior vena cava, and this could lead to inadvertent penetration of the superior vena cava or high incidence of malfunction. There are three types of venous access device infections that can occur in home parenteral nutrition patients. Catheter exit site infections that's manifest by purulence at the exit site can usually be treated with antibiotics and frequent dressing changes as long as it doesn't involve the uh, tunnel. If the tunnel is involved with an infection, that can never be permanently cleared by antibiotics. And in that instance, the catheter should be removed and a new catheter placed on the opposite side. Catheter-related bloodstream infections can occur without any manifestation looking externally. The exit site can be perfectly normal and the tunnel site can be perfectly normal. Typically, classically, this patient will manifest with high fevers, septic shock, shaking chills upon the infusion of their uh, parenteral nutrition solution or their IV fluids. And this is a, an emergency. Those patients should be admitted to the hospital and just placed on standard IV fluids and their parenteral nutrition solutions held and started on antibiotics after obtaining blood cultures through the catheter as well as peripheral venous blood cultures. If the catheter cannot be cleared of infection, as shown by repeated catheter uh, cultures that are positive, that catheter should be removed. Their survival on home parental nutrition in this older report is fairly favorable for patients with congenital bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ischemic bowel disease, or motility dis disorders, or radiation enteritis without active uh, evidence of a cancer. Those patients with neoplasm or A's have a far reduced survival on HPN. If you just look at adult survival, survival on HPN for patients with benign diseases, this more recent report in 2011 shows again very favorable survival for patients with Crohn's disease, short bowel syndrome, chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, or radiation enteritis, as well as systemic sclerosis or patients with class 4 desmoid tumors. So in benign disease, the long-term survival on HPN is fairly favorable. There are complications that can occur, and most of the mortality complications are related to the patient's underlying disease. A smaller group, about 20%, is related to the home parenteral nutrition complications, and again, about 20% are related to diseases other than the underlying diseases or the patient's primary disease. <laughs> 
Most of the complications related to HPN are due to inadequately treated sepsis related to an infection in their catheters lumen. Liver disease has also been reported in HPN patients, especially in early reports. And this report about 19 years ago showed that two thirds of patients developed abnormal liver functions within six months of starting HPN. 40% had cirrhosis or portal hypertension within a year and a half. And one out of five died of complications of liver disease. This was usually associated with a bowel length of less than 50 centimeters, or in those patients who received parenteral lipids in excess of one gram per kilogram per day. In our own report on 162 patients on HPN, getting one and a half grams of protein per kilograms per day, 25 total calories per kilogram per day, but lipids was limited to only 0 0.28 grams per kilograms per day. In these patients, severe liver dysfunction occurred at only seven out of the 162 patients, and only one patient could it be attributed to the parenteral nutrition. Again, we feel that's probably related to reduction in the amount of intravenous lipids given to these patients. Oxalate stones can occur in patients on HPN. Normally, oxalate combines with calcium and is excreted in the intestinal tract. However, after extensive bowel resection, fat malabsorption occurs that binds with the calcium and free oxalate is available for absorption that gets into the kidney and forms calcium oxalate stones. This is an example of a patient with severe radiation and aritis and short bowel syndrome, showing him at the start of his program of home parental nutrition and after he had regained all of his uh, weight. He continued on home parental nutrition for approximately three years before dying of a new lung cancer that appeared. This next patient is a patient with Crohn's disease and short bowel syndrome who was placed in home parenteral nutrition and after six months had regained all of his weight on home parenteral nutrition, still continued to need the uh, parenteral nutrition at home. And at the, as of this date, approximately uh, 35 years later, is still doing well on home parenteral nutrition. HPN is covered by insurance, by Medicare, Medicaid, commercial payers, Medicare replacement plans, and the VA hospital coverage. It's important to get social workers involved in helping to determine and apply for insurance coverage in these patients. Intestinal rehabilitation programs for patients with short bowel syndrome or intestinal failures are important to reduce dependence on HPN or IV fluids for patients with intestinal failure. And these programs include diet, medication, growth factors, surgery, and in some rare instances, intestinal tr transplantation. The dietary management of short bowel syndrome includes reliance on small, frequent meals and ingesting enough food, minimizing concentrated sugars, maximizing complex carbohydrates, limiting fluid intake with salads, sips of fluids between meals to maximize absorption, <laughs> 
oral rehydration solutions, antidiarrheal medications to prolonged intestinal transit, and commercial fiber supplementation. It's very important to get a well knowledge uh, dietitian involved in the management of those patients with intestinal failure and short bowel syndrome. Vitamin and mineral supplementation is also very important, and vitamin and mineral status should be carefully monitored. This is an extreme example of hyperphagia in a hospitalized Swiss patient that was shown in Time magazine about uh, 40 years ago, and all the uh, calories she had to eat in order to maintain nutrition, but she still needed supplemental IV fluids. Obviously, this is uh, carrying it out in an overboard uh, fashion. Oral rehydration solutions are important, and the rationale for their use is the sodium glucose co-transport, so that if you have sodium and glucose uh, approaching the intestinal lumen together, that enhances the absorption of both the sodium and glucose and result in water absorption as well. There are ineffective oral rehydration solutions uh, like ginger ale, some sports drinks that are hypoosmolar, ginger ale, apple juice, chicken broth are not only hyperosmolar, that may lead to increased fluid output from the gut, but also don't have enough sodium in the case of ginger ale or apple juice, or too much sodium but not enough glucose in the form of the chicken broth. G2 plus added salt or a World Health Organization oral rehydration solutions are both effective at enhancing sodium and glucose and water absorption. And this just shows what a combination of G2 Gatorade and half a teaspoon of salt can uh, you be used to approximate World Health Organization oral rehydration solutions. Anti-secretory agents are important to reduce gastric acid output, especially in the first six to 12 months after a massive small bowel resection. And this just shows the oral, uh, the uh, H2 blockers that can be used and can be used uh, orally, but if they are used orally, maybe having to be given in an increase over the typical uh, oral dose. In addition, proton pump inhibitors can be used as well. And some of these agents are compatible with parenteral nutrition solutions, especially the H2 uh, blockers. Anti-motility uh, meds are of importance, such as uh, loperamide, diphenoxalate, or codeine. We rarely use tincture of opium currently. The anti-motility meds prolong transit time to optimize absorption of fluid and nutrients, and they should be given 30 minutes before meals and at bedtime, and we use the ICD-10 code K90-9 for diarrhea due to malabsorption to uh, use in prescribing these medications. The combination of emodium and codeine together sometimes are more effective than each one individually. <laughs> 
anti-secretary agents, somatostatin and analogs, slow down GI motility, but they also reduce gallbladder contraction and may lead to the development of gallstones. They also inhibit secretion of most GI hormones that may interfere with intestinal adaptation, but they do decrease fecal water and sodium losses and reduce gastric acid secretion and can be given either sub-Q or in the TPN solutions or given subcutane or intramuscularly uh, once a month. So if the patient demonstrates benefit with sub-Q administration or IV administration, they can be switched to the cheaper form of intramuscular administration monthly. Fat malabsorption is common in patients with intestinal bowel intestinal failure or short bowel syndrome, and that can be helped with the administration of pancreatic enzymes. And this is usually Creon or Zanpep that can be given, and that sh the pancreatic enzymes should be given with meals or snacks to enhance fat absorption. The diagnosis of fat malabsorption can be made by looking at stool fat content or the history of a patient having fatty stools or greasy stools or floating uh, stools. Bioacid binding resins may be useful in patients who have choleretic diarrhea. That is, they have had just a limited resection of their distoelium and malabsorb uh, bile acids, and that can sometimes be helped by the administration of cholestyramine or cholestopol. And that's usually just given uh, before meals several times a day. Antibiotics may be needed for patients with intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and there are a variety of non-absorbable antibiotics that can be used to uh, inhibit uh, bacterial overgrowth. The patient with bacterial overgrowth will present with smell filling, uh, sm foul smelling, flatulence, and uh, they'll uh, become bloated and uncomfortable from the gaseous bloating. Usually the antibiotics are given over seven to 10 days, once or twice a month, and uh, they are shifted so that the same antibiotic is given every month so that there's no resistance that's built up. The surgical treatment of intestinal failure is composed of restoring GI tract continuity, prolonging intestinal transit with the use of reverse segments or valves, although in North America, those aren't used too frequently now. Increasing absorptive surface area by the use of lengthening procedures, and if necessary, small bowel transplantation. Restoration of GI tract continuity is demonstrated in this patient who postoperatively after having an emergency colectomy and abdominal perineal resection for ulcerative colitis, developed multiple fistulas in its abdominal wall as well as in the perineal area. He was placed in home parenteral nutrition for stage reconstruction of the gastrointestinal tract over a two-year period. Initially, an initial presentation in the hospital, he underwent drainage of an abscess, a proximal diversion of his small bowel with creation of a proximal jejunostomy or surgically created intestinal failure. His nutritional status was restored, restored and maintained when he was sent at home. He was readmitted 
multiple times for stage fistula resections and restoration of the continuity of his GI tract. And his last operation after a two years interval was takedown of his diverting stoma. This shows his uh, anterior abdominal wall, 27 year follow up after his small intestinal reconstruction. So the combination of stage reconstruction of his GI tract and home parental nutrition allowed him to become a more satisfactory surgical candidate to eventually undergo these stage reconstructions. Intestinal lengthening procedures have been used also on these patients, especially if they have dilated segments of small intestine. The Bianchi procedure relies on the fact that the mesentery of the small intestine can be divided to supply each side with its own blood supply. Then the uh, interval between the two sides is stapled to form two cylinders that are joined end to end to lengthen the intestinal tract. The serial transverse enteroplasty or step procedure was introduced in the early part of the uh, 2000 and 2003, and in this representation, 83 centimeters of a Bianchi dilated jejunum was converted to 147 centimeters using the step procedure. In comparing intestinal lengthening for short bowel, comparing the Bianchi versus the step, 14 adults, 50 pediatric patients, the intestine was lengthened from 45 to 68 centimeters. Surgical complications occurred in 10%. Two thirds or more than two thirds were able to come off of TPN. Liver disease improved. And there is no significant differences in outcome, but the step procedure in this series was easier to uh, obtain or to achieve uh, procedurally. The indications for intestinal failure transplantation is if the patient fails home parental nutrition. That usually means they develop impending or overt liver failure central vein thrombosis of two or more central veins, frequent central line sepsis, or frequent episodes of severe dehydration. Besides these four indications that are considered failure of home parental nutrition, also patients who have a high risk of death attributable to the underlying disease or intestinal failure with high morbid morbidity or low acceptance of HPN have been considered candidates for small bowel transplant. There are four main types of small bowel transplant, intestinal alone, if the patient has significant liver disease, intestine plus the liver, or because of anatomic and vascular considerations, either a full multivisceral or a modified multivisceral have been used with success. Growth factors have been used recently to uh, allow for increased absorption of nutrients, increased uh, villus height, and increased days off of parental nutrition, and allow for weight gain. The long-term benefits of growth hormone, however, have been controversial. And in the Cochrane database analysis, it seemed that once treatment was stopped, benefits did not continue, and there were some potentially significant side effects and it wasn't generally recommended for short bowel syndrome patients. 
More recently, GLP-2 has been uh, used for patients with intestinal failure and short bowel syndrome based on the fact that malabsorbed food residue stimulates L cells in the distal ileal and colonic mucosa to produce GLP-2 normally. If the patient doesn't have the distal ileum or the proximal colon, GLP-2 is not normally produced, and it's in these patients that GLP-2 can be of significant benefit. GLP-2 decreases gastric emptying, inhibits gastric hypersecretion, induces jejunal epithelial hyperplasia, and it is elevated in short bowel syndrome patients if they do have a colon, but if they don't have a distal ileum or colon, then it's markedly reduced, and this is the instance where GLP-2 can be of significant help. When GLP-2 is uh, either given exogenously or stimulated by nutrients given through the GI tract, it decreases motility, it decreases apoptosis, it increases proliferation, and increases absorption of uh, nutrients. And this experiment comparing uh, placebo in blue to a GLP-2 analog, teguglutide, the GLP-2 analog markedly reduced the uh, dependence on parenteral nutrition with a marked reduction in parenteral nutrition volume at uh, both eight weeks, 16 weeks, and 24 weeks compared to placebo. GLP-2 analog teguglutide was therefore approved by the FDA for use in patients who are dependent on home parental nutrition. Exclusions include a history of suspected or, act, or active malignancy, patients with an ultra-short bowel syndrome not expected to respond, patients who have intestinal obstruction where they're not able to take in nutrients, active inflammatory bowel disease, uh, getting systemic immunosuppression, patients who are pregnant or lactating. Side effects theoretically can include abnormal cell growth, intestinal obstruction, increased absorption of that can lead to fluid electrolyte abnormalities if correction is not made in their intravenous fluid or parenteral nutrition fluids, and increased absorption of oral medication so that corrections may have to be made in their oral medications. The recombinant human GLP-2 analog does increase villus height, crypt depth, and absorptive capacity. It was approved by the FDA in 2012. It's administered by sub-Q injection once daily. And before starting the patient, the patient should have colonoscopy to rule out any presence of polyps, amylase, lipase, total bilirubin and liver function tests to rule out significant pancreatic or liver disease. And these levels need to be monitored prior to starting the GLP-2 analog and every six months after their start. This picture on your left shows a stoma at the start of daily tegaglutide, and three months later it shows luxuriant growth of the uh, mucosa. This sometimes can lead to obstruction of the stoma, and you may have to reduce the amount of tegaglutide being given to the patient. Glepaglutide is a long-acting GLP-2 analog that has recently been shown to increase absorption of mac macronutrients and increase uh, body uh, weight and was reported as a phase two trial presented at Digestive Disease Week in June of 2018. 
A phase three clinical trial has been approved by the FDA to compare clepaglutide to placebo in patients with short bowel syndrome, evaluating for safety and efficacy of a once or twice weekly dosing of the uh, GLP-2 analog. It's being conducted in 20 centers. 20 centers across the United States, Europe, and Canada. In summary, short bowel syndrome or intestinal failure management is very challenging. The sequela of massive small bowel resection are potentially life-threatening and definitely life-altering. There are multiple therapeutic options for managing the patient with short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure, and the use of diet, medication, home parental nutrition, home IV fluids, surgery, and if necessary, transplantation speaks to the importance of a multidisciplinary team needed to ensure successful outcomes for these patients. Thank you for your attention.